Thank you all for coming out. I see, I'm looking around, and I see at least three different classes of my classes. And even here from Gustavo's class. Gustavo, okay. Anyone else? Good. Good. So uh, it's Friday. I, I want to say thank you for coming out on Friday, supporting us. Um, it's been a good semester. I got a lot of work ahead of me. You know, I got a lot of grading to get to this weekend. So I know a lot of you are expecting, uh, you know, grades quickly. Uh, Monday, Tuesday. You know, we'll, we'll get to it. I got I got a lot to do. So. But uh, I do want to say thank you for being here on Friday. Uh, I want to acknowledge the students that were with us last Friday. We went out to Long Beach, right, for the Pro GTL Summit. Where are you guys? There's, yeah, oh, Ray, put your hand up. Yeah, Troy, good. Uh, four of you are here, right? Good. You guys have a good time last Friday? Good, good. Global trade and logistics, um, that area is obviously very crucial to us in business. You know, with the ports here, the, the crucial role that we play in, in Southern California, you know, I can't, I can't state it enough. And I want to have more opportunities to get you guys out there to find out about the jobs that exist. And that's part of the reason why we have uh, the speaker that we have here today. But before we get to her, I would like to introduce Brandon Shimi, who was part of the uh, Friday event last week. Brandon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. So I'm a West, a West Los Angeles person, so it's always great to come back to, uh, to this campus. So, so thank you, uh, Professor Batosik is doing a terrific job. And for those of you who participated in our summit last week, uh, I hope you do two things. Uh, one, tell friends, tell your colleagues about it. Uh, and and you know, we'll, we'll get to the speaker and presenter, but I do want to remind you something that I think we oftentimes forget. 95% of the world's population is outside the United States. Now that's a big world for us to discover. And the great exciting thing is today from our presenter and speaker, which you'll hear from Professor Matosik, who's gonna introduce her to you. She is helping to discover parts of the world that sometimes have been really closed off to the rest of us. So, uh, so with that, we really, really uh, are excited to have her, but more importantly, as she'll remind you, this is an interactive conversation. So think about some questions and some comments that she may want to take into consideration. And we're really excited about West LA participating in this. It's a larger seven community college regional collaboration uh, throughout the LA Orange County area that we want to encourage you to participate. So there's going to be other events on other campuses. We're kind of coming to the close of the season let you guys have a little bit of rest and relaxation over the summer, but we're hoping that we will be kicking up that again in the fall. And through Professor Matozik and some of your other professors, uh, we would of course want to make sure that you guys get a chance to participate. And just talking about collaboration, we have a professor here from uh, Glendale College. Uh, so Rafael, thank you for joining us as well. So you can see this is very much a big tent uh, a party. So we want you to be part of this uh, in the future. So with that, let me hand it over. Thank you again, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, Brandon. The glasses go on because the eyes are old. I'd like to introduce our speaker. We're very, very happy to have her. We're, I think uh, it's, a, it's a real privilege for the college to have someone uh, like her here with us today to talk to us about uh, not just global business, but a whole bunch of other things. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She's the founder, president, and CEO of the Global Research Institute of International Trade, that's G-R-I-I-T, a think tank consulting firm focused on trade policy analysis and advising businesses on the best strategies for taking advantage of global market opportunities. She's also an instructor at UCLA Extension in the Department of Business Management and Legal Programs, where she leads, or where she teaches <coughs> courses such as Fundamentals of International Trade and Introduction to International Business. Her book, It's Not Just the Economy, Stupid, Trade Competitiveness in the 21st Century, was published by Cambridge Scholars Publishing in April 2016. Her research on free trade negotiations, industry competitiveness, and international trade rules has also been published in her top peer-reviewed academic journals, both nationally and internationally. She earned a bachelor's degree in journalism and Spanish at the University of Southern California, and she was over on the East Coast with her master's and her doctoral in political science at Brown University. Please help me to introduce Dr. Sarita Jackson. Okay. All right. Okay.
Okay, so I know we just had lunch, and I know how it can be after lunch. So I'm going to make sure that we're all doing very well. We're pretty good. We're excited. We have. A, I know. <laughs> I can do that. A little salsa too. Okay. So we're all energetic, right? All energetic. We're all doing well this afternoon. Okay. Let me just start out asking a little question here. How many of you have been following what's going on politically in some of the debates over the last year or so for this year's presidential elections? Okay, a few hands, a few hands, all right. <laughs> okay, and then for those of you that have been following it, have you heard this thing about free trade and some of the arguments for or against free trade, or at least free trade being an issue, right? Okay, good, great. All right, well with that, having said that, one of the <laughs> things when we're talking about international trade and how this relates to the, the presidential elections, there's this concern about what free trade means for U.S. companies, U.S. workers, U.S. consumers, but mainly how we compete, where we stand in the global economy. So what I'm going to do this afternoon is talk about this whole idea of what it means to compete, hence trade competitiveness in the 21st century. And I'm going to talk about you know, what, what the current debate is, what the current discussion is with respect to free trade and competing in the global economy, and then present an alternative way of understanding free trade. And whether you agree or disagree with the candidates on their different positions about free trade, their understanding or their proposals for helping us to compete in the global market, one thing I give them credit for is, number one, that we are at least discussing it. And number two, they are hitting on a very key point about free trade, which I am going to reveal this afternoon. So, with your position, with your permission, I'd like to take you on a journey, on a journey about global competitiveness. And I'm going to break this journey down into three different components, if that's all right with you. Okay. The first part is the current mission to competition. When I talk about this current mission to competition, basically I'm talking about how business people, economists, currently describe what it takes to compete in the global economy. In other words, looking at existing models and arguments for what is needed in order to compete in the global economy. So that's the first part. Second part, competition in the 21st century. All about the path. And I'm going to explain the path through this, throughout this presentation. So what I am hoping to do is to expose you to another way of understanding industry competitiveness in the global economy. So moving away from some of the existing arguments and looking at a new approach that works in the 21st century. <clears throat> if you don't remember anything else that I say about this new approach, just remember, like everybody talks about the secret. We've all heard about the secret, right? Okay, so for trade, it's the path. Just, so just remember that word, if you don't remember anything else, the path. And I'm going to elaborate on the path for you so that we can get on the right path to competing in the 21st century. And then lastly, we'll get to the whole exciting part about Cuba. So I just came back from Cuba, I was there last week, just got back late Sunday night. And so in the, over the course of a few days, taking, trying to process all of the things that I got a chance to see during this trip compared to when I went four years prior and take the same approach about the path and put that within the context of at least what we're seeing or what we could possibly see with respect to U.S. business, U.S.-Cuba business relations. All right, so here, current mission to competition. Okay, so bear with me. Our driver is going to take us on a little journey here. This one, that is one of my Cuban drivers. Going through Havana. Okay, short clip. Okay. <laughs> and as you can see, just or you can kind of see at least in terms of the buildings, and I'll just give more of a description of what I saw when I was going through Havana, is that 
Okay, many of these buildings, they're run down. They, they're still standing, but they're run down. They could do, use a little paint job. And that's what I'm doing with this current mission to competition and presenting my approach. That here, we have a building, we have an infrastructure, right? And then with my approach, we're just going to paint it up just a little bit. Does that work for everybody? We want to start working on painting up this building. So in terms of the current arguments or current um, explanations for what it means to compete, before I get to that, let me throw this up to you. Okay, just think about within the global economy. What are some of the things that you think about that will lead to any industry, whatever that may be, being competitive in the global economy? What does it mean to you to compete in the global economy? Anything? Labor costs? Yeah, we did. I don't know, maybe a, maybe a product or service that um, I think is a great idea uh, here, in, here at home, but I'm wondering about what's the, what's the ability of that product or service to be uh, uh, something that someone else might think is also uh, okay. a strong product or a strong service, but, you know, outside. Okay, so if you have a product or service, so basically, and am I summarizing this correct, the demand trying to find out if there is a demand for that product or service. Okay? All right, anybody else? If you have a product or service, what do you think would make it competitive in another market? Whether we're looking at our neighbors, Canada, Mexico, or looking overseas, or looking at the possibilities in Cuba, what are some of the things you would think would make your product or service competitive? What types of approach would you take? Yes? Uh, well, we might, we might want to do a considerable Okay, so looking at the particular culture, but also the needs within that particular country. Okay, great. So I'll use those two responses. So looking at the demand, okay, is there really a demand? for this particular product or service, which gets back to the needs, and then also understanding the cultural environment within which you are working. Right, and those are absolutely correct. Those are a whole host of number of factors okay, that come up when we're talking about what you need to do to compete in the international market. I'm going to list, look at a couple of others. Now this photo here is a tobacco factory from a tobacco factory here in Cuba. Okay. And when we're looking at, okay, if I want to access, let's say, the Cuban market or any other market for, for whatever reason, for my particular product or service, there are a number of different arguments that we look at, including the ones that we've just heard right now. And the first one comes, boils down to usually cost, having a cost advantage. So you may have a product or a service, and that's someone calling for our product or service. <laughs> Let us know what country. <laughs> okay, so you may have a product or service, and there may be a huge demand for that product or service, but remember, you're competing against so many other countries that may be able to provide that same product or service. And one of the things, and I'll just keep tying this back to Cuba, sprinkling Cuba throughout until I get to the section focused solely on Cuba, is that's one of the things that I hear a lot of times when people say, well, you know, Cuba, there's a lot of need, basic needs. I'm going to try to export in Cuba. And I said, well, that's great, export to Cuba. And that's great, but are you aware that there still is a lot of competition? Cuba's been closed off to the United States, but look at all of the competition that you're dealing with from providers from other countries that are already in that particular market. So when you're talking about provide, meeting a demand, then you have to take into account how do you compete when it comes to costs. And usually, when we're talking about costs, that usually refers to lower labor costs. Okay, does that make sense? And if anybody has any questions or need clarification, feel free to just raise your hand and stop me so that I can go back over some of this. Okay, so that's the one thing. Labor costs where your goods are cheaper on the international market, thus making your goods more competitive. Okay? But you know, 
Labor costs, that's only one part of one part of the equation. Government policy is another one. Looking at the role of government in determining competitiveness, your ability to compete in the global market. Okay? And that can mean a range of different things. So with, again, with your permission, just a brief history lesson just about the role of government and how we've seen the role of government in international trade or in the economy. Okay? Here in the United States in 1930, okay, the United States played a big role in the economy, but one where it was protecting your producers, starting off with your agricultural producers and your manufacturers, protecting them from foreign competition. Okay? Then throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, mainly like most of you, most of your Latin American countries, by the 40s, the 50s, the 1960s, Many of them started to do the same thing, be protectionists. Does protectionist, especially from the debates, does that word kind of ring a bell to anybody? Have we heard of that phrase, protectionism? Okay, sort of like, can somebody tell me, I, I have selective amnesia right now, about Donald Trump. Can anyone talk about Donald Trump and, and some of the things he's proposing? Have we heard anything about what he's proposing to protect, uh, or to, so that the United States could perform better in the international economy. Anything, any proposals that he has thrown out? Particularly as he talks about China. He's talked about our trade imbalance. Uh -huh. That seems yes. to be an important piece of, of his uh, message. Yeah, that um, you know we, we bring in a lot of Chinese product, but they don't seem to take a lot of our product. Absolutely. Right? So the imbalance, he thinks there's an issue there, and that we're, we could do better. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in terms of our trade imbalance, basically meaning that we are importing more from China and then we are exporting, or to the, to the global economy, generally speaking, okay, because we have a huge trade, trade imbalance with the world, so it's not just against China. But one of the things that he has talked about is imposing tariffs against any goods coming from China, and that is what is called protectionism, okay? So what I've just described in terms of the role of the government here in the United States, as well as Latin American countries, is this whole idea of protectionism, meaning you're, where the government steps in and protects local producers from foreign competition. Okay? And that's what we saw a lot of in the 20th century. Yes? Dr. Jackson, maybe, maybe you can do a little pop quiz here on some of the students back there, because they seem shy, but uh, they're aware of some of these other barriers to trade, right? So, okay. I don't know, maybe you can throw a couple, you know, what do we call barriers to trade? Good, all right. Uh, what are they? Right? Okay. We... Nobody will jump me in the parking lot, right? <laughs> what's, what's, another, what's, what's, another, what's another name for tax, you know? Yeah, okay. Oh, did I hear tariffs? <gasps> oh my god, we're, oh my gosh. Okay, we know. <laughs> okay, can someone, all right, so as I usually do, I kind of have the selective amnesia. Now I was rambling on, uh, so my, my experts back here, Tariffs? So just remind us what tariffs are. Anybody? Oh, come on. You guys are experts back here. Anybody? What tariffs are? Or your understanding? Tax. I heard tax. Ta uh, tar tariffs are taxes on imports uh, that countries on, impose on uh, other countries. Absolutely. Important goods. All right, I think I can sit down. You want to come up and handle the rest of it? Uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you're up. Okay, so absolutely. So you're going to see that word pop up here. But yes, absolutely. That's what tariffs are. So they are taxes on imports. Meaning that, you know, I just, I'll throw out another country. Let's say Mexico, okay, which we don't have anymore. But let's just say if I'm trying to export my dress, I design dresses and I'm trying to get them into the Mexican market, well, guess what? If they are saying, okay, well, we don't have, which we do, we all know that we have a free trade agreement with, um, with Mexico and Canada, but let's just say we did not, then that's where Mexico can say, all right, we'll go ahead and place a tariff, a certain percentage on those dresses coming from the United States into Mexico. So that's what a tariff is, any taxes on any goods that are imported in that particular country, okay? All right, 
So taking that and moving to the 21st century, when we're I'm still here on the government policy, when we're talking about government policy, now what we're seeing, this whole idea, there's a, a, a term competitive advantage. And the argument is that in order to compete, now the government still plays a role, but a different role. Meaning that the government should just kind of loosen re regulations or restrictions and make it easier for businesses to actually flourish and thrive in the global economy. So that's what we mean by government policy. Okay? And then, just kind of going around here clockwise, exchange rates, and that's a huge issue that we see that comes up in the debates, the presidential debates, about this, uh, the value or devaluing of currency, okay? But just keep it, keeping it simple with exchange rates, basically just whatever the value of your currency is on the international market that may make your goods either more expensive or less expensive, which will make those goods more competitive. Okay? And then just the last two, the last three here with industry clusters. That is a term that comes up in trade a lot. And a lot of times, and the reason why I mentioned many of these even though I think that they're, they're good to a certain point, but need to be uh, thought about or reanalyzed re when applying this, especially to other countries trying to develop their competitive advantage in the global market, is that when I was working on a number of projects funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development, a lot of the arguments or a lot of the <coughs> proposals that we talked about on what determines competitiveness kind of Definitely centered on one of these industry clusters. Okay? And industry clusters, just in its simplest form, just basically means that where you have industry and an industry and supporting industries all coming together to support each other. Alright? And I often use the example, let's say I'm in the Caribbean and I produce some banging hot sauce. Right? Okay, I don't eat hot sauce, but let's just say, okay? <laughs> because on many of the projects, was, I usually dealt with somebody that could make some really, really good hot sauce. Okay? Well, you know, you're not the only one that's able to make that hot sauce. You might have other competitors that can make hot sauce. But if I'm a hot sauce maker, then what I would do is try to align with other industries, other supporting industries, such as someone that can do the packaging someone that can do the labeling, marketing. That's what we mean by industry clusters that will help my hot sauce to stand out okay, from the competition. Okay? So that's what we are talking about there. And then firm strategy is pretty simple, just the role that businesses take in, in order to compete. So what is the types of strategies that they develop in order to compete? And then lastly, technology. Okay, the argument is that those, those uh, countries that have more access to technology will actually be more competitive, okay? Because the technology will increase productivity, lower costs, and thus will result in more, uh, being more competitive in the international market. Okay. But now, remember, I talked about this path. But while these arguments are fine in terms of understanding what it means to compete in the global economy, there's a huge reality that's being left out. And that's why I say with the, with the current presidential debates, at least it brings attention to something else that really determines competitiveness that does not necessarily have to do with what is happening in the market. Okay, but before I get to that, I'm just going to open this up. When you guys go shopping, when you're shopping for clothes or food, what shapes your decision in terms of where you purchase your goods? What, what do you take into account when you're going to buy something? Quality. The quality of the good? Price. Okay, quality, I heard price. Price, okay, so higher prices? Or lower prices? You want lower prices? Oh, you want higher prices for your goods? Oh, okay. I was going to say, well, come on over. Let me start selling you something. <laughs> okay, so lower prices for your goods and quality, right? But a lot of times, let me just see a, just kind of to see a show of hands. How many for lower prices? Okay, so we have a good number, right? And then for quality? 
Okay, so it's about the same, all right? But for that quality, you still are going to look at, all right, if, if I have two identical products or even services, then I'm going to go for the, the lower cost product or service, right? Is that correct? Is that safe to assume? Okay. So that's, and as I pointed out, that's what we usually talk about when it comes to cost, all right? So I'm just going to give you a little history of how I got to even doing this project, all right? I, I am going to talk about Cuba, but I can't talk about Cuba without talking about some of the other Spanish-speaking Caribbean countries or even Latin America um, where we already have a trade relationship or a business and economic relationship. So over the past 10 years or so, I, I spent a lot of time in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I was just doing research, just really just trying to understand, well, you know, what is the relationship like between U.S. producers and any given industry and the same producers in that particular country and understanding. Some of you, a few of you heard me talk about my background is really in political science. So with that, I was studying how do these countries actually negotiate these agreements and things of that nature. And while studying the actual negotiations of some of these trade deals, then this is where I came up with this whole idea about the path. Okay? So can we just say that? Path. So when I'm famous on the next Oprah Winfrey, like I saw Dr. Jackson, and she was already talking about the path. Okay? <laughs> All right? Okay, so in doing that research, trying to understand well, what would make a business owner import more expensive material from a country where that has higher labor costs, more expensive, and then try to export, I would think, okay, that I would be thinking, well, that might not make my product that competitive on the international market. And so here we go, and I'm just gonna go through this very quickly, but just keep it, you know, try to keep it simple. That this path has three components. And it's important to understand this so when I get to Cuba, we'll understand how some of the things we can look at as our relationship with Cuba evolves. Okay, the first part of that path takes us back to the historical trade relations. Okay, historical trade relations. In other words, with some countries, in particular industries, there has been a history of trade and trade agreements, not free trade agreements, what we talk about today, but some type of agreement put in place that goes back to, with Latin America and the Caribbean, let's say the 1980, early 1980s. There have been some agreements that have already been put in place so that Let's say if I am that yarn producer here in the United States, like North Carolina, huge textile, where they relied on textile for a long time. If I am a yarn producer or fabric maker or whatever, well, my yarn or my fabric might not be that competitive on the international market, but because of this history, a trade deal that has, or, yeah, a trade deal that has been in place, then I have access, special access to that specific market, okay? So, that, so that's what, that, what the historical trade relationship is about. Then, with respect to trade rules, okay, that's another thing to understand, especially when we're talking about trade agreements. A lot of times people will come to me and say, well, Dr. Jackson, do you think NAFTA was good or bad? And it's really hard for me to say, because I, I often say that, well, in order to understand the benefits or the costs it's important to understand exactly what is in that agreement for that particular industry, whether it's the service sector, agriculture, or manufacturing. Okay. And then lastly, bargaining power, because many of these agreements are actually negotiated. So it's important to understand the relationship between the countries, as well as the industry associations that are setting some of the agenda, setting some of what is being negotiated, Understanding, sorry, the bargaining power, what is that bargaining relationship when negotiating these trade deals, okay? So that's all that, that's it. In a nutshell, we we're talking about the path. So, getting to Cuba. Okay, so this is Cuba. This is actually at Ernest Hemingway's home where they're taking sugar cane and they're making sugar cane, sugar juice, okay? Now, with Cuba, one of the things that I just want to point out is that 
we see a similar trajectory, okay? Can anyone just, I just want to see where we are in terms of what we understand of some of the things that have been happening with policy with Cuba. Anybody want to give it a shot? Like, what are some of the things? Has the embargo been lifted? What's going on with respect to Cuba? Or what, what are some of the things you've read about or your understanding about U.S.-Cuban business relations? I know. <laughs> Anybody? Grab someone. Grab someone. I keep looking at one person. I don't know how anyone else. Okay, there we go. Um, that they not doing trade imports. Okay, so that the United States and Cuba is not trading with each other, that there's nothing, no business relationship at all, you're saying? Yeah. Okay, all right, anybody else want to jump in? Renee, you want to jump in? Sorry, because sorry, I know you're <laughs> um, Will Obama open up to people going back and forth? Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that companies are starting to go over, try to negotiate, and do impossible business. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So we, we are trading more with Cuba. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just going to leave it at that. Because actually the numbers show we're kind of declining, which is quite interesting. But where it's opening up to allow for more opportunities to trade with Cuba. And what we've seen, especially starting in December of 2014, where President Obama made an announcement where he eased some of these restrictions, okay, the embargo is still in place. We still have an embargo between the United States and Cuba. But what you're seeing now is it's just easier, slightly easier, to do business, okay? But what that is, that's for specific industries, okay, specific industries. So this still goes back to the path about understanding the rules and the legislation that, that govern this trade relationship. So when Obama made this announcement in December of 2014, he was basically saying that now we're going to allow additional products from the United States to be exported to Cuba, as well as some services. Okay, But that was nothing new. All right, Are any of you aware that we've been trading with Cuba for the past 16 years? Anybody? It's, if, you don't, if you didn't know, please, it's OK, too, because most people didn't. All right? Did anybody know that? Okay, well, actually we have. We have been trading with Cuba since 2000, okay? So this goes back to the whole setting up these rules that allow for some kind of trade relationship, okay? It doesn't mean that everything's open from the United States to the Cuban market, but particularly in agriculture, and being here in California, we have a huge agricultural industry. <coughs> agriculture and medicine okay and this goes to a policy that took effect in the year 2000 and then when Obama made his announcement in December of 2014 it was just basically adding on to that allowing for additional products from the United States to be exported to Cuba okay and so when bringing this back to the overall argument or my overall model when we're looking at industry competitiveness that again that it's very in a nutshell it's just very important to understand what policies are put in place that increase market access or hinder market access okay and just speaking of Cuba one thing I want to wrap up and I and it will be interesting to see while I was in Cuba, uh, you know, I had people ask me, well, what do you think about the embargo? When will it end? Well, you know, my guess is as good as yours when the embargo will be lifted. But I did ask someone, and from the, the rural sector, because I got outside of Havana, was able to talk to people from all across, you know, from different areas in Cuba. And I asked the gentleman, I said, okay, if the embargo is lifted tomorrow, what do you think is going to happen in terms of our U.S.-Cuban relationships, do you think that we will actually enter into a free trade agreement? And this is only one person's opinion, of course, and he said, yes, I think so. All right, so whatever happens will remain to be seen, but this is something to follow any types of trade deals or anything that's put in place that will give you that access, access to a market that, say, um, you know, that same industry from another country may not be able to enjoy. 
So that is it for me. That's the end of our journey. Viva Cuba. Nice. Okay. <laughs> and thank you so much. And I just want to open it up now. If there are any questions about anything that I've said or just questions you may have about international trade in general or just about this particular field. If you don't mind, yeah, I got a okay. great question, and hopefully, you know, you guys can learn from this too. Um, you, you mentioned that we've been trading for the yeah. last 15 years with Cuba, although it seems like a lot of us are unaware. Could you tell us how, and, right. and, and in what ways, and how is it legal? I mean, if we have an embargo, how, do, how does that work? How did that work? Right. So what happened in the year 2000? You have President uh, Bill Clinton at the time it signed into the legislation. <laughs> where basically it was saying because there's such a need for food and medicine that we're just going to open it up and allow for only food and medicine to be exported to Cuba. So that so it was just basically from him because you, to lift embargo that's on Congress. So the Congress has to lift embargo. But since, you know, the, we'll see what happens with Congress, they did not, then the president can enact a specific legislation. And as a result of that, and this is so, a lot of the work that I've done, where I will talk to people in the agricultural sector saying that, well, this gives you an advantage because, quite frankly, Cuba imports the majority of its food from the United States. And so it was just because of that piece of legislation signed by President Bill Clinton in 2000 that allowed for food and medicine to be exported to Cuba. Would that have been considered an executive order? Oh. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing, you know, and that's what we're seeing now with President Obama, where he is loosening the restrictions, but he can't really go as far as lifting the embargo. That's still left up to, to the Congress. So how many countries have already started? I know some of the airlines have mm -hmm. been going over um, so that people could travel yes. back and forth. But any of what other industries and companies are looking at? Some industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have a lot of your film industry, your telecommunications, banking, most definitely, uh, Airbnb, and, <laughs> and it's one thing, though, it's really interesting because it's one thing to read about Airbnb, getting it to, to Cuba, and I give them a lot of credit for their whole marketing strategy, how they did that, but talking, reading about Airbnb and actually experiencing it, because this last time, as opposed to staying in a hotel, I stayed in one of the, what they call Casa Particulares, or literally translated, particular houses. And in Cuba, what they had, they've been doing this ever since the 1990s, actually, because there were some even reforms in the 1990s under Fidel Castro. They've been doing this whole Airbnb type thing since the 1990s. And so now the things are opening up more than Airbnb has started joining up with these individuals who would rent out their home to tourists anyway and offer that same type of service. So Airbnb is one in particular. I know MasterCard has entered film, as, as the gentleman here said. Uh, Starwood Hotel, you know, so a lot of things in the tur tourism industry um, have already started going into the Cuban, Cuban, <laughs> Cuban market. How is the progress made in uh, Agua, that is African growth? Opportunity Court Act. Okay. And how is NAFTA? How is the progress made on NAFTA? Okay, so I have two questions. All right, let me start with the first one, AGOA. Okay. Okay, so this is taking us to a completely different region. AGOA stands for African Growth and Opportunities Act. Okay. With AGOA, well, number one, the, I mean, it has been beneficial, but I have my, my suggestions for improving AGOA. But let me just kind of to bring everybody in. What AGOA is, is it's a unilateral agreement. So with the United States and Sub-Saharan African countries, eligible Sub-Saharan African countries, right? And basically what this agreement says is it, it tries to promote trade between the United States and Sub-Saharan Africa but there are some really strict conditions under that. But this agreement is not negotiated between the United States and, and the Sub-Saharan African countries. Rather, it, everything is driven by the United States. And last year, AGOA almost, well, we were concerned about whether or not it would expire. 
uh, because it only stays in place for a certain amount of time. And it was reauthorized by the U.S. Congress for another 10 years, okay? But when you think about a GOA, a -G -O -A just think about, okay, this just promotes trade between the United States and Sub-Saharan Africa. Again, with that one, it depends on the industry. And for me, when I speak about a GOA, I can mainly talk about textile and apparel because that's the industry that I study more closely. Now, what impact it has on larger economic growth, uh, you know, th that varies, obviously, by the country. But I would think for, you know, and this is a small country, most people don't, probably have never heard of Lesotho, okay, it's a small landlocked country within South Africa, on the map you'll see this, this little country within South Africa, where they benefited because of the provisions that said that all right, in order to export your apparel to the U.S. market and gain access to the U.S. market, you have to utilize U.S. Uh, US inputs, U.S. textiles, right? And it's beneficial in that because at least they could increase their exports to the U.S. market. It's beneficial in that regard. But when you put it in the larger context of having to compete against Latin American countries that can do the same thing, particularly Asian countries, then uh, the, the benefits, the true benefits, are questionable. And so one of the things that I often throw out, I'm going to do just a second, one of the things that I throw out and then I often propose, even in my book I propose a last chapter where I talk about, okay, let's take the, the model that is applied to Latin America and the Caribbean and look at it for Sub-Saharan Africa, and that's where I promote uh, more of an agreement that is negotiated. Then you ask me about NAFTA, the, more, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Well, unfortunately, um, in terms of manufacturing and from a jobs perspective, then we're all, you can't argue that. Unfortunately, the numbers of jobs that we expected from NAFTA did not necessarily turn out. Instead, it was the reverse. We had a large number, loss of jobs. In the services sector, we have a huge surplus. Okay, so following NAFTA, once NAFTA was implemented in 1994, we've seen where U.S. services exports have actually increased, so there is a surplus where we're exporting more to the NAFTA countries than we are importing, okay? But when it gets to wages, that's another area where there's a concern, okay, you may have this increase in service jobs, but then are people really having the same wages? Not necessarily, they're usually lower paying service jobs. However, again, when you look industry by industry, some industries have actually been able to take advantage of, of NAFTA and actually grow or, or thrive, become thriving industries once again. So, so it varies by industry, but if you just talk about labor, it hasn't been that positive, but for consumers, for businesses that are individual firms that are taking advantage of that, then you know, the numbers have been uh, more positive. Yes. All right. Um, how is Cuba relevant to trading with the uh, United States? And mm -hmm. what resources exactly are you guys talking about? Because I'm kind of confused. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, if somebody's presenting Cuba to me, I want to know what is it exactly that is, is relevant. Because, I mean, I'm kind of kind of okay. confused. So the first question, how is Cuba re relevant to trade with the United States? Right now, yeah. What's okay. the relevant? So, so I'm going to take... So I'm going to take that first part. So the reason why it's relevant is because we're, we're opening up the market. That's why it's such a huge deal. Okay, because we've been closed off from Cuba for so long, mm -hmm. like over five decades. Like tobacco or something like that. Well, well uh, now you can bring in tobacco. <laughs> Only $100. Uh -huh. But go ahead. What, how is that? Right? No, go ahead. Go ahead. So go. that basically is just the fact that it's, it's opening up another market for U.S. businesses. That's the relevance, mm -hmm. that now we can trade with this particular market that we've had an embargo for so long, number one, on the U.S. side, and then on the Cuban side, you know that it's a socialist economy, right? So socialism means we don't have, we don't support a lot of the private sector, okay, private businesses. Everything is run by the government, okay? So, so the relevance for the United States is Economic, but then there's also the political component. Now we're opening up, we're, we've established, reestablished diplomatic relations, and then now we're opening up a whole new market for U.S. businesses. 
And that and that's the whole idea behind it. And, it, and let me just make sure, clarify. It doesn't mean that it's easy, but just think about it. If here's a market where there's so many there are huge needs, basic needs, well, wouldn't you want to try to access that market as opposed to a market that where there's so much competition, they're already developed? That's, so that's where that fits in when we're talking about international trade, and particularly between U.S. and, and the two countries. And what would be your trading? So right now, as I was saying, we're already trading. We've been trading for 16 years. So right now, if you're in the agricultural industry, agricultural. you will do well, okay? Uh, well, like, you, you, there was opportunities, okay? Because there are still challenges on the other side. All right, and then as we were talking about just since December 2014, where if you're in services, right? So if you're in the tourism industry, certain services related to tourism, that's an opportunity. Banking, financial services, those are opportunities for the financial services for accessing that market. Entertainment, I mean, just what the last few months where you see some oh, okay. I don't know, I Netflix, something, another being filmed in Cuba. So, so that's the thing, and that's why it's so important to look at it now while things are still gradu gradually opening up, following the policies and seeing what's allowed. One other, area, one other thing that I just want to mention that I didn't mention earlier with uh, the December 2014 announcement is also agricultural equipment. So you're not just talking about the food product, but now if I'm designing tractors or whatever goes into you know, agricultural equipment, then now there's an opportunity for that market as well. Okay, does that clarify yeah. for you? Yeah. Great, okay. Yes. Um, so, um, so, so the U.S. can only export, not import, from Cuba. Yeah, we can't import. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So numbers are still zero, zero, zero. <laughs> so hopefully one day things. Well, yeah, we'll see what happens, but things open up. All right. Did I see it? Yes. I'm wondering if you can elaborate on um, Cuba's uh, partners in trade over the course of the last fifty years. All of them, the U.S. We said 16 years with the U.S. Uh, right. Plus 50 years. Who's who have been the primary suppliers? To right. Exactly. So, agriculture, because that's the one you know, that I've studied the most. Brazil has been a huge partner when it comes to agriculture. So, for example, if we're talking about exporting beef or something like that, that's where I often, again, reiterate that you have to be aware of these other countries that are already in that market. So when you look at some, the actual trade statistics, our numbers have, U.S. numbers have actually declined in terms of the exports to Cuba. And that's because of looking at some of these other partners. Brazil has been, has played a major role. I know Spain has. So those are the first two that come into mind in terms of their trade partners for getting some of the goods that they need. So, Dr. Jackson, I think it would be really helpful for a lot of people. I, obviously, we're talking about you know private business and mm -hmm. entrepreneurial opportunities, but as you know, our project is really designed to introduce career yes. pathways and opportunities, the other path, right? Yes. So, talk a little bit about what you see are job growth and career growth opportunities mm -hmm. within the global international trade space. Okay. So with international trade, there are just there are so many different opportunities, so many different areas just within international trade alone. So I'm going to st start talking about my area particularly. Okay, so from a policy perspective, so even though I talk a lot about business and started my own company, but from a policy perspective, that is one opportunity. And here in the state of California, there's so much push. You, uh, my friend back there mentioned the GOA, where there's, I mean, from a policy perspective, there are a number of different things on the ground happening to continue to support a GOA or to come up with another policy to enhance a GOA or develop uh, other policies so that we can maintain that trade relationship with the United States of Saharan Africa. So those are opportunities for just getting it in international trade from a policy perspective. Being here in Los Angeles with the Port of Los Angeles, then also our neighbor, the Port of Long Beach, a lot of that, that's another opportunity. And I think I saw a few hands that went up for the summit, went to the summit on the 20th of this month, where logistics, that's another uh, career opportunity. So where you can meet individuals that are in that particular field, learn about you know, 
whatever's going on with logistics and how you get into that particular field. The other area from, obviously from a business perspective, if I just want to actually be an importer or an exporter, that's the other, other area. And a lot of times we see where people start their own businesses and say, okay, you know, look, here's something that there's a need here in the United States or just right here in Los Angeles, I'll import, okay? Or I'll export to a particular product to a country where they might need that. And then the other area is market research, okay? And that's a lot of what I do as well, okay? From the market research side, if someone comes to me, like my friend here, and says, okay, I don't know, I don't get it. Tell me about Cuba. What are the opportunities? Well, then I can do that research, and there are others as well, where they will do that research and say, okay, well, we might have this particular product. These are the products that will do well in the Cuban market. Or if you're interested in the Cuban market or any other market, well, then these are the products you should consider exporting. So those are, are the areas, policy, logistics, what else did I say, as a business market. owner, and then from market research. I have one last yes. question. So besides the Cuban cigars, what else does Cuba, Cuba import? No, well, it's not necessarily that they export. Not necessarily that they export it. It's just the people that visit that bring it in. Mm -hmm. So now the Cuban cigar. Let me just tell the story about how with me traveling twice. Okay, like now I can bring in Cuban cigars, and I did. Okay, but it's up to a value of hundred dollars. I don't smoke. I don't smoke cigars. But everybody's asking me for these cigars, and so since I was at a factory, it's like okay, I could get some cigars, right? Uh, so you can. It's. Basically, I bring it in. It's not as if you know, you're getting a whole bunch of exports from Cuba to the United States because there's still a cap on how much each person can bring in. Okay, so that, I mean, that's the main thing. And then before, when I traveled before, you could still bring stuff, but it had to be educational material. Just like when you travel now, you can't, I mean, you technically you cannot travel as a tourist that you have to have a license to say that this is an educational trip or a business trip there are 13 categories you have to fall in with within one of those so when i traveled four years ago and everybody was saying bring this bring that i didn't bring anything back i said unless it's educational which was, were books i didn't bring anything back because i was so nervous about having problems trying to get back into the united states but now it is it's easier to bring things but it's but there's still a cap. You have to understand what those restrictions are in terms of what you bring into the United States. Well, if I can, I just want to thank everybody again for showing up. Dr. Jackson, it was a pleasure to have you today, um, getting your insights and uh, for all the information and your time. I want to thank you. Everyone, I think, uh, would also like to thank uh, Dr. Jackson for being here.